palmemordet We Got This med Schiaffino Musara. Sveriges statsminister Olof Palme är död. Jag inte det är sant. Ta emot på Sveavägen. Hör du, de säger att det är Palme som är skjuten. Motvapnet med säkerhet i en smitten vässen, en revolver kaliber 357. Inte ett svar. Det finns inte ett svar. Polisen söker en man i 35-40-årsåldern med mörkt hår och lång mörk rock. Välkomna till podden Palmemordet som idag görs av mig, Tobias Andriksson på PRS Media. Vill du bidra till podden och se till att vi kan ge oss kast med fler stora spår? Eller vill du kanske höra mer om polisspåret? Oavsett vilket så har du möjlighet att gå in på patreon.com-palmemordet och skänka en summa som vi får per publicerat avsnitt. De stora spåren kommer att avverkas efterhand som de finansieras och om det blir ett fall i sponsringen som till exempel under den pandemi som drabbat världen när det här spelas in så återupptar vi spåret så snart vi är tillbaka på grundnivån på Patreon. För ett tag sedan gjorde vi ett program om musik som influerats av palmemordet och utredningen. Idag kommer vi att fortsätta att titta på hur mordgåtan påverkar populärkulturen, men med en helt annan vinkel. För i vår kommer nämligen en mörk komedi om mordet på Olof Palme att sändas i SVT. Idén kommer från amerikanen Schiaffino Mosera som numera är bosatt och verksam i Sverige. Serien heter We Got This och har premiär på SVT den 3 maj 2020. Men mer om det kommer du att höra i själva intervjun. Då ska jag finna och helst tala engelska kommer intervjun att genomföras på det språket. De allra flesta av er hänger säkert med, men skulle ni ha svårt att höra vad som sägs kan ni söka efter palmemodets sida på Youtube. Där kommer vi att lägga upp en textad version av intervjun. Och innan ni påpekar det väljer jag att säga det själv. Min engelska är inte perfekt på något sätt, men jag hoppas att ni ändå kan hänga med i intervjun, med eller utan text. Jag började med att be Schiaffino att berätta lite om sig själv och sin bakgrund, då många svenskar kanske inte är så bekanta med honom. Uh, yeah, I was actually born in uh, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, in the mm. southern part of the US, mm. uh, a little town called Marietta. And um, well, the sort of the the short version of how I wound up here was that I, I started out as an actor mm-hmm. in my early 20s, and I, I did a lot of theater and stuff like that. And I was pretty eager to get away from my hometown, um, so I moved. First, I moved to Boston, mm-hmm. lived there for about a year, and then hooked up with a buddy of mine who, who was in film school. Uh, and while I was there, in film, uh, he, he was in film school, and I started taking classes to learn. Screenwriting, um, so I was acting and writing and and doing all that kind of stuff. But I was still in my like early 20s, so I didn't really know what the hell I was doing with my life or what. I didn't know how to manage any of that or turn it in, in, into anything no. in particular. But then eventually we moved to New York, mm-hmm. uh, and New York is where I met my Swedish wife. Um, we met at uh, we met at this very bizarre audition. That turned out it was an audition. It was a callback for a movie, but it actually turned out to be a party. But it's yeah. one of the normally you go in for a callback. You you know, oh here's the pages. You read this. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but you showed up and it was just like a loft in New York. And they're like, yeah, it's a party and just act natural and have a good time. The financiers yeah. are paying for the party. Like we'll tell you at the end of the night. Like if you got the part. And yeah. anyway, I was like, okay, fine. It's an open bar, free food. It was a band plan. Uh, and within five, ten minutes of, of being there, I met this smoking hot Swedish girl. Yeah. Uh, I'd never met anybody Swedish in my entire life. I mean, I couldn't find Sweden on a map at the time when I met my yeah. wife. <laughs> uh, but she, um, we became friends very quickly. Yeah. Um, and I guess we, we sort of hung out and became friends for about two months or so before mm-hmm. we started dating. Uh, yeah. And then... <clears throat> 
she like a lot of you know people from from outside of the country her her visa was kind of coming to a close and we'd only been together for maybe six months and I was like you know what I can't I would never ask this woman to marry me after six months but I I know that I love her mm-hmm. let's just roll the dice and see what happens yeah. what's the worst thing that could happen we could get divorced right I'm thankfully we're on we're going we just had our 21st wedding anniversary we have two kids. Uh, mm-hmm. So it turned out to be probably the smartest decision I ever made, <laughs> actually. Uh, and if there's anyone who I can credit mm-hmm. with having just even introduced me to Olaf Palma, it would be her. Yeah. Um, because I've, the first time I ever saw Olaf Palma's face, I remember, was on that trip when we came here in 1999. We came here to get married. And I think it was around the same time they had recently found, I can't pronounce this, for, I'm terrible at pronouncing things in Swedish, but what was this? They found a gun in a lake. Mokfjad. Uh, 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 yeah. Christ, I can't. <laughs> I've been here for 13 years and my Swedish is embarrassingly bad. Uh, but anyway, it was ra- yeah. right around the same time. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those, you know, when you go to the press beer on, you know, you got the, the headline yeah, there right. and it was a picture of Olaf Palma and a picture of the gun. And I think there was also a picture of a lake or something. Yeah. And I was like, babe, what the hell is this? Who's that? Yeah. She's like, what, what do you mean? Who's that? That's Olaf Palma. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but I, I, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, he, I, I don't know who that is. <laughs> no, no, no. How do you not know Olaf Palma? You know, in America, we... <laughs> I mean, I was obviously I was only 11 at the time when Palmer yeah. was killed. Yeah. But also, in Amer- when you grow up in America, you get very used to kind of being in this bubble, where you don't hear a lot of news about uh, what's happening in the rest of the world. And at the time when Palmer died, I, hmm. you know, being 11, I, I wasn't really reading the newspapers back then, in the same way that I do now. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so she's the one who kind of turned me on to it. Yeah. And and she gave me sort of the short version, you know, that kind of uh, enough for me to realize it was basically kind of Sweden's version of JFK. Yeah, exactly. right. So exactly. um but the the thing that I thought was so unique about it, I mean, whether you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald killed JFK is kind of irrelevant because they I mean, they did actually close that case. Yeah. Right? Did. So let's fold it up. We're done. Mm-hmm. Of course, conspiracy theories and all that stuff popped up, and lots of people don't believe the official story. Um, but, but there's nobody. When I it was it was years later that I, I really came to understand the uniqueness of the Palma case. Yeah. In that it's still open, mm-hmm. uh, and and then of course stumbling onto this thing about the 50 million Swedish crown reward was like, are you gotta be kidding me? Because I. And I, I think of everything from a from an American perspective. If sure. if there was a fifty million dollar reward yeah. for anyone who could solve the murder of JFK, uh-huh. I mean the chaos and insanity that would be swimming around that even after thirty some odd years, I mean it, it, it would be nuts. Yeah. There'd be a whole yeah. cottage industry built around solving yeah. uh, the JFK murder if there was a, a, a big reward like that. Yeah. And it, I just found it a little fascinating that that there was really just kind of only a small handful of people in Sweden yeah. who still cared. Mm-hmm. Um, and not even necessarily about the reward, but... But about the closure of the case more? Or about yeah. getting getting someone com- convicted? Yeah, the, the yeah. thing that shocked me the most was how few people even really uh, knew mm-hmm. who, who he was, what he was about. Sure. Uh, my kids, they don't, they don't teach it in school. Um, I mean, I saw the way they teach the the Palma legacy, the assassination. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's mm-hmm. literally like two paragraphs. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, it just felt I was some, something felt very like strange to me. Like, why? I mean, I get that because the case is still open, it's rather embarrassing yeah, sure. that it hasn't been solved. So, you know, that qualifies as something you'd like to mm-hmm. sweep under the rug. But at the same time, it's like, Jesus, guys, mm-hmm. come on. Yeah. But let's let's uh, yeah, so put it in ahead. perspective. No, 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 no problem. <laughs> I, I was just thinking, because as you say, you don't hear or learn much about uh, uh, Palme as a person or mm-hmm. Olaf Palme, uh, the murder case mm-hmm. in school. But if, if we look at the US and uh, the John F. Kennedy case, mm. uh, is it different somewhat? Do you have, do you read about it in school, in history class or something? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I mean, it's not, <clears throat> you know, I mean, they might, 
I think it's also quite regional too. Like, mm-hmm. he, he, you know, where I grew up, maybe they might not talk about it as much as maybe kids who go to school in Massachusetts, which is mm-hmm. where Kennedy was from. Sure. Um, but I can say from I am from the same town that Martin Luther King uh, is from. Yeah. Uh, he was he is also from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, when his birthday, I mean, we we have a national holiday for Martin, Martin Luther King, King Day. Day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's like the fact that they don't have a national. I mean, and especially considering the fact that you Swedes, you you love your red days, mm. right? <laughs> you guys love a freaking day off. Yeah, sure. for just the dumbest things ever. What the what was the one that's like thirteen days after Christmas? Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, yeah, thirteen yeah. days. We're gonna celebrate that one. Why the fuck can't you have Olaf Palma Day? Yeah, sure. Instead of thirteen days after Christmas, yeah, that's like sure. the dumbest holiday I've ever heard. I get it. Everybody likes to take a day off. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. But it seems like if you're gonna bother to have a day off, it should be for something kind of important. Yeah, sure. And it was. You can hate him or love him, but he was an important yeah. person. He was an important politician, and I mean, I I'm with him that I never thought of that before. That we mm. don't, we don't. Um, what should I say? Protect his legacy. Mm. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right about that. But well, yeah, whether you love him or hate him, he put Sweden on the world stage. Sure, sure. I'm, I mean, that's absolutely. that's a fact. But. Your um, fascination for the uh, Olaf Palme case it was introduced to you by the Swedish newspapers and your wife, basically? Well, actually, and, well, so the funny part of the story, which yes, kind sure. of led to me um, coming up with this idea for a TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was introduced to Palma back in 99 mm. and largely kind of forgot about him. Um, after we got married, we moved. We went back to the states, and we lived there for a while. I moved here in 2006 okay. uh, to Stockholm, and um, I, I sort of stumbled into the movie business, TV business, and started working a lot with uh, lots of different things. You know, mm-hmm. <clears throat> sometimes as a writer, sometimes as a director, sometimes as a DOP mm-hmm. filming. Um, anyway, I started my Swedish company. I think it was probably 2008, maybe. Um, and I had I, I I've had a situation where I had I had a really good year financially, followed by a really bad year. Okay. And I had misunderstood the whole Swedish tax system, which I learned later learned was a pretty common mistake actually. Yeah, sure. uh, I thought I had already paid taxes mm-hmm. for the good year. Yeah. I thought I was paying as I was going. Sure. Uh, and then in the middle of the bad year. My accountant contacts me and tells me, uh, "Yeah, here's how much tax you owe from last year." I'm like, "Wait, what? Last year? Yeah. What? Are, I don't have this." Like, no, no. and then that was the moment that I learned I was essentially in the middle of a bad year. I was living off of what was supposed to be tax money, yeah. sure. um, and I kind of panicked because I didn't know how I was going to pay this debt. Um, <clears throat> and the first thing I saw was a story about a. I think it was a grandfather and his grandson. They had a mm-hmm. they had a metal detector and they stumbled onto some Viking gold down in I think it was in Lund actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so they stumble onto this Viking gold and then they sold it to a local Viking museum and they made millions off of it. Yeah. And I was like, shit, that that's I need something like that. Yeah. Like I need a a a big bang quick fix kind of yeah. And so I started searching for ways. Like to make fast money without breaking the law, basically. Like, how do you make fast money without being a drug dealer? Uh, and I stumbled on this. It was like one of those websites where it was like a list, right? Top ten things. If you found them, you'd be an instant millionaire. Okay. Uh, and like, it had things on there like like the original World Cup, which was stolen mm-hmm. in Brazil. Yeah. Never found. Not, if not. you found that, you'd be an instant millionaire. There was another one. It was like a ship that belonged to the Vatican, full of gold. Um, sank somewhere in the Indian Ocean or something. I don't yeah, remember where, okay. but but that was one of those where it's like you need money to make money. I, yeah, sure. First, you got to find it, yeah. you know, and then it's like shit. How the hell am I going to pull this thing up out of the water? And then I'm sort of clicking through this list, starting mm-hmm. to feel like an idiot. Like, what am I doing? You know? And then all of a sudden, up pops like number six, Olaf Palma. Yeah. And I was like, what? Olaf Palma? What the hell? And that that was actually the first time I learned that there was a 50 million Swedish crown reward okay. for anyone who could provide that information that led to the killer. And I kind of, I got super excited all of a sudden. And it's like that weird feeling when you, 
it's totally irrational. But like for like a split second, I thought to myself, like, 50 million Swedish crowns, that's perfect. And then, you know, the reality kind of sinks in. You're like, yeah, sure. wait a minute, I've never solved a murder case before. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why this case is still open, right? Um, but that split second where everything seemed possible mm. was essentially the basis of the show that I decided to write. Yeah. This character who, who, when introduced to this seemingly unsolvable murder, um, you know, looks at this 50 million Swedish crown reward, mm. the botched police investigation after the fact, <clears throat> and kind of looks at it from the perspective of how hard could this possibly be? You know, mm. this couldn't possibly be that difficult to solve. Yeah. Like, if you just give me a chance, take a crack at it, show me some information, I, I could wrap this thing up by the end of the year. No yeah. problem. Yeah. And so that's kind of the perspective that I wrote it from. Yeah. Um, naturally, it's a good starting point because it gives you the opportunity to, you know, when you write something like this, every character needs his own kind of journey, his own arc, sure. right? He needs to sure. start here, and things need to happen so that he changes along yeah. the way. So yeah. he goes, obviously, from how hard could it be to obviously realizing, oh, crap, now I get it. Now I understand how hard it is. And also kind of realizing that that the the murder itself, like what it meant to Sweden, what it did to the country, what it did to the people, mm. Uh, it's bigger, it's more important than the 50 million sure. Swedish crown reward. So that's kind of, it's it's a nice little emotional yeah. journey. So basically, uh, the TV series you are making are based on that thought that I, I can, I can, maybe I can solve this or maybe I can give, because the series uh, is named, uh, we got this. We right? got this, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, What was that the thought you had in your mind at that split second? We got this. I can solve this. Yeah. I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's tragically American, I, I guess, probably in some ways where you're <clears throat> we a lot of Americans, we, we because we think we are in this at the center of the universe. We kind of we kind of think we got everything. Like, yeah, whatever. Like, if you just... No, I've never solved a murder case before, but if you gave me all the information that was in the Palma Group, mm -hmm. I guarantee you I could solve this thing. Yeah, sure. Americans, we have this, like, weird confidence yeah. about us that's completely unwarranted. Like, it doesn't really come... Most of the time, it doesn't come from any kind of real experience or anything. It's, But that that's the American myth, you know? Yeah. It's, it's sure. it, The whole story of America is built on... on um, on lots of people who, who in the early days of the forming of the country had no experience in doing what they were doing and they just kind of plowed through and figured out a way to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of what made America such a great country, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time it's also what makes us kind of annoying on the world stage because we think we can do anything. Uh, and a lot of times we wind up fucking everything up. <laughs> <laughs> but say, when, when you saw this list with all the mm. uh, things you could do, when you realized wow, this is a good thing. Was it immediately in your mind that you were going to write a, a script about it or how, the process of yeah, going well, from a thought to a script, so to speak? went through a lot of different phases, actually, mm -hmm. because whenever you come up with an idea like this, I mean, your first thought is like, should it be a movie or should it be a TV series? Sure. Um, and my f movies are always easier to make in some respects because they're they're shorter I mean we made a six episode TV series that's like making three movies mm. shooting for 60 days non-stop uh, you know over the course of three months it's exhausting <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah but um, and initially I think I was going to try to do it as a fake documentary mm. like I wanted everybody to just kind of be themselves yeah. I was going to be me and everybody else mm. I mm. wanted to be in it was going to be themselves um But then I realized there was doing it as a fake documentary came with a lot of uh, sort of uh, legal jeopardy, I mm -hmm. guess you could call it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> Pretending. I mean, you guys probably know that. I mean, I th I've always thought that was kind of fascinating when I started reading about the Palma, mm -hmm. uh, researching and all that stuff and all the abbreviations that everybody uses, you know, like Policeman A and, yeah, sure. you know, KB and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, why? What? Yeah, yeah. And some of it's just to be for the sake of brevity but in some cases it's because you don't want to get sued Legal for defamation Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and when I started to realize that I was like okay this story needs to be completely made up yeah. um, so I basically kind of 
flipped into a fictional mode and started writing it from a perspective of a guy who, uh, you know, very much like my real situation, had had run into trouble with the Swedish tax authority. Uh, and after trying to kind of solve that problem in some more practical ways, uh, he sort of accidentally stumbles into the Palma case um, by way of this crazy um, cat lady who's putting up signs about her missing cat. Uh, right, and he he finds her cat, and when he returns the cat, she's not there, but she has her own private Palma investigation wall, and he's like, "What?" You know, he goes home to his wife, and he's like, yeah. "What? This is a thing? Like, what the hell is this? Like, why are people doing this?" <laughs> and and she shows him the uh, you know the the website for the official investigation, the Palma Group, and yeah. and and then. And she's the one who kind of reveals to him in the show, mm-hmm. you know, well, you know, it was a big deal and people have a hard time letting it go. But then, of course, there's some people who just want to solve the case because, yeah. you know, they're only interested in the 50 million. He's like, I'm sorry, what? 50, 50. Did you just say 50 million? Are you kidding me? And then he's like, bang, he's hooked. Yeah. Right yeah. away. Sure. <clears throat> and so the first half of the show is kind of a. This funny experiment and him like trying to sort of stick one foot in, yeah. but trying to make sure that he also trying to make sure that his wife doesn't think that he's completely losing his mind. Mm. Um, but, you know, as the show progresses and he gets closer and closer to the truth, mm-hmm. uh, keeping it a secret from his wife becomes yeah. pretty much impossible. But because my, my experience is that if you stick one foot in, mm. Uh, at one point, you have water all over your head because yeah. you there's so much information, there's so much uh, That's theories. One of the most fascinating things about writing this show was y- you realize pretty quickly mm-hmm. that the line that separates writing about the murder of Olaf Palma, whether it be for the sake of like a nonfiction uh, type thing, um, you know, like a like a documentary or a book or whatever. Uh, to fictional, like the, the line that separates writing about Palma and actually investigating the Palma murder mm. is almost invisible. Mm-hmm. And you don't even know when you've crossed it. No, I, like yeah. suddenly you're getting a phone call from a guy who knows a guy who thinks that he knows the guy who oh, drove yeah. the shooter home. And you're like, why the hell? Why am I getting this phone call? <laughs> this is not, <laughs> I do not deserve this phone call. Why is this happening? Mm. Uh, you know, crazy stuff like that. I wish I got one dollar for every time someone called me and said, I have a person who knows a person who has yeah. a contact who saw yeah. the murder. Yeah. I mean, and of course, some of it might be true. Yeah. It, I mean, the, the police did a really sloppy investigation yeah. uh, in the beginning. Yeah. And so it might be true that someone hasn't been heard by the police, but mm. then again, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. No, it's, it's, you can trust everyone. Let's say that the thing that, but that what I mean is that like once you've crossed that line, it's yeah, like sure. you kind of you're sort of on your own to sort of pull yourself back, yeah, yeah. you know. And and that's actually a big part of what the show is about too. Is like what would happen if you really sort of lacked that ability to sort of pull yourself back to that kind of logical side of that line. You know what I mean? Like yeah, what yeah. what happens and what happens if you cross that line and you go too far? Mm-hmm. And and going back across the line yeah. towards the logical side is no longer an option. No. Like then what do you do? Like if the only if the quickest way out of this thing is to keep going forward, what ha- what does that look like? Yeah. That's that's drama. Yeah. That's tension. That's yeah. obviously uh, drama, but is it, it uh, when you talk about it, it sounds almost mm. like a, a sort of a dark comedy yeah. thing. How do you describe the, the, the genre? Or Well, traditionally, uh, I mean, it simply stated, it, it should be called a satire. Yeah. Um, I've been told that I shouldn't call it that. But okay. For what reasons? Uh, well, because I think satire implies that you're making fun of someone. Yeah, okay. Uh okay. I, and and I guess I mean we don't make fun of all of Palma. Quite the opposite. We kind of it's when you see the whole show. I think most yeah. people will see that it it reads more like a tribute. Yeah, sure. To all of Palma, uh, we do spend a fair amount of time making fun of the Swedish police, which I think is quite warranted. Whether you think they're involved in the murder is totally irrelevant. Sure. But how they actually handled the investigation, mm-hmm. that was the part 
that made me convinced that it should be a dark comedy. Yeah, sure. Because when I sat there and read just the things that were happening the days after the murder, mm-hmm. um, it, for me, it qualifies as comedy of the absurd. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. where it's so yeah. horrible that it, you you either have to just go crazy or you have to laugh mm-hmm. about how ridiculous the investigation was and how it all played out. Sure. Um, so that's why, but th- that was not a very popular opinion at the time <laughs> when I came up with the idea to do it as a comedy. No. I mean, it took over five years to get somebody to agree to make this show. From 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 the moment that I uh, came up with the idea yeah. and started, you know, initially when you come up with an idea like this, you don't start writing the scripts right away. No. You put together a kind of a synopsis of where you think the story sure, should sure. go. I had some very funny meetings along the way where people were like, wait, you want to make a comedy about the murder of Olaf Palma? I'm like, yeah? I'm like, I, I don't understand how the murder of Olaf Palma, how is that going to be funny? And I was like, well, the murder's not no, the funny no, part. No, exactly. That's not the funny part. I was like, the, the, the comedy of the absurd related to the investigation, sure. plus, you know, all of the Privat Spawner and, like, yeah, some of the yeah. ideas that they've come up with yeah. and some of the theories that I started to read, like... I mean, I couldn't, I know this, it's maybe you have to have a certain type of sense of humor, but the first time that I heard that there was a theory that Olaf Palma had faked his own death because mm. he had AIDS, I almost fell out of my chair. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> because, not because, it, just, only because I just think it's, it's, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard it in my is. life. It is. But it's so funny to think that someone seriously thinks that. And, and the funny thing is that if you look at all the theories mm. and find this one the most plausible, then or most... <laughs> I mean, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't understand. I don't. I really don't understand. If that's the one, yeah, yeah. that's not the police. It's not the like Victor Gunnarsson or something. <laughs> who? Yeah, I mean, they have a kind of motive. Yeah, they may have a yeah. weapon, but no, he faked his own death. Mm-hmm. An actor was taking his place at Svea Vägen. Exactly. I mean, it's it's. It's like a build-up for a good comedy. It's the most absurd idea I've ever heard in my life, and I laughed so hard when I heard it. Um, and I just felt like this... I mean, this is crazy. Like, yeah, sure. If you do a sequel on that one, I want 10%. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, you know, for me, it was it, the hard part about writing it, too, was that because there is so much information within the Palma labyrinth, like... Everything, all of the theories, all of the people, all the names, all the possibilities. Sure. Um, and when you when you write something like this, uh, structure is very important. Uh, you need to have like a really tight and clear and clean way of traveling all the way from the beginning to the end of the story without confusing the audience, mm-hmm. right? So. That was really more like a trial and error thing. I, I think in the first, the first versions of the script had too much information about the Palma assassination, and we realized as we started pulling things out, it suddenly became more readable and more, yeah. more of a flow to it. So I, it, it kind of led to a situation where I think, uh, I think people who don't know much about the Palma case will be very much intrigued um, mm-hmm. by the case related the case stuff itself. in the show. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> But it could also be the case that some of the Pervot spot, the people who know everything, yeah. Yeah, sure. um, while they might be excited to see the show, they might come off of it maybe a little disappointed that we didn't go further. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We also had a fair amount of um, uh, sort of legal issues to deal with mm-hmm. along the way. Um, I mean, every time we turned a script into SVT, there was sort of an army of lawyers who have to go through it to make sure that we don't say anything um, that could get us in trouble. Um, There's been a few cases over the years related to media projects where where people got in trouble. I think Call Girl was probably the most famous one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, But, I mean, you got the the biggest uh, TV channel in Sweden, the biggest... uh, could you say biggest media company? The big, at least one of the biggest. They're, to they do are, your, I'd your say they're show. the biggest. I'd say they're the yeah, biggest. I'd channel. say the biggest. Yeah. What happened was actually, that's an interesting story as well. Um, 
So, I, like I said, for mm -hmm. five years I pitched this thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to do it. Okay. No one. Um, most of the time when I pitched it, it, the guy on the other end of the table looked like he was like looking for the eject button. Like, how do I get this asshole out of my office? <laughs> this is a terrible idea. I have had, I had people tell me this, you know, ha, ah, funny, but never, never, never. It's never no, going to happen. No. And there's something, I don't, maybe that's I, something about my personality, I think, that sure. when somebody tells me that something can't be done... Um, it just it, that kind of drives me crazy. It's like a trigger. Yeah, it is a bit of a trigger, yeah. and especially because uh, maybe it helped because I'm not Swedish. But the idea, I under, look, I understand the the nature that led to telling stories about Palma like this, like to be somewhat taboo. Mm -hmm. um, you tend to sort of, especially when someone's assassinated, you tend to kind of they, they become sort of like a saint. Yeah, sure. Right, um, and also, you know. Comedy is comedy is a difficult thing to prove on a piece of paper, right? It means different things to different people. And you walk into a room and I tell you I want to do a comedy about this. Um, so I, basically I realized that I needed to show people what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so along with this woman, <clears throat> my producer, uh, Anna Sophia, she and I basically put our money together mm -hmm. and we sh I wrote a script a trailer script. We basically we made a trailer that made it look like the show was already done. Um, and when I started showing that to people, mm. suddenly they got it. They got the idea that yeah. You, okay. That re the, and they also realized that as far as like you know, again we weren't making fun of Palma. No, sure. If anybody was the joke, it was kind of it was me. Mm. The fact that that my character thought he could solve the most unsolvable murder in European history. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was the real joke. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and as soon as people realized that, suddenly it went from one of these projects that nobody wanted to do to one that people actually kind of started fighting over. Mm. Um, we quickly signed a deal with uh, Jaroski. Yeah. The same company who did uh, Vorti the New and mm. Soul Seed. And, mm. Mm. Um, and then... I think it took a little while to get SVT to say yes. Mm -hmm. They were definitely scared. Uh, we pitched it to a few different places, a few different channels before um, before we wound up at yeah. SVT. And I'm not sure why they said yes, yeah. to be honest. Um, but yeah. I mean, it kind of quickly turned out to... Uh, making that trailer was kind of a game changer. Okay. Once people were able to see what it was that I wanted to do and the kind of tone, like the type of comedy, it's very... I guess if I had to describe... It's a very un-Swedish comedy. Like, here, when I look at Swedish media, I think the division between genres is, is in my opinion, it's too, it's too stark, right? Mm -hmm. It's either a drama... Or it's a comedy, mm -hmm. and if it's a drama, it's very dark. Mm -hmm. And if it's a comedy, it's very silly. Yeah, sure. Um, and in America, we don't. We sure we do that too, mm -hmm. but we also have this tradition of kind of blending the genres. Sure. And the idea that you can, and th and that was the thing that sort of surprised me that you know I'd been in this business for long enough to see that mm -hmm. everybody wants to see. Uh, Breaking Bad. Everybody wants to see Orange is the New Black. Everybody wants to see, uh, you know, Weeds, like all these different things that are both funny and serious at the same time. Um, but nobody seems to make those kind of shows yeah. in Sweden. Everybody wants to watch them, but nobody makes them. Why is that? And why, why is that impossible? Yeah. You know, I'd met plenty of people. Writers, creators, mm -hmm. directors who I knew were capable of doing this kind of stuff, but it was the people at the channels who were always saying no to those kind of projects. I'm like, this can happen. This, th there's no reason why you couldn't have that kind of show in Sweden. You don't have to choose between drama and comedy. You can do both. Mm -hmm. You can walk and chew gum. This is fine. We'll, we'll make it work. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, and finally, I think, yeah, that, that's the thing I'm most excited about. I'm hoping that, that this show will, will spark more shows like it, mm -hmm. to be honest. Because the, when, I think the average Swede is going to watch this show, mm -hmm. and they're going to probably feel like they've never seen anything like it. Uh, 
But when when discussing with the SVT about the uh, about the project, uh, did you have to change anything? Were they parts <laughs> where they were like, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't. Yeah. It was. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. You told me, but we haven't told the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, first of all, okay. So there's a little trick mm -hmm. that I learned from. Uh, I learned it from Michael. Was it Michelangelo who sculpted yeah, sure. David? Mm -hmm. Michelangelo. Uh, I don't know if the story is true, but mm -hmm. the story goes is that he he finished the statue of David. Mm -hmm. He thought it was perfect. The people who were paying him to do it were going to come by and look at it and give notes and and you know criticism and all that kind of stuff. So he came up with this plan where he he took a bunch of marble dust in his hand. Um, And he was just, he had a chisel in, in the other hand. And, and when they showed up, one of the guys was like, God, oh, that nose is too big. Yeah. Is, is, can we change that? Is there something, can we try? You, you know what? You're right, actually. That nose is too big. Yeah. I can fix it. And he gets up on his ladder. He goes up there. He pretends to chisel away at the nose. And he just sort of drizzles some yeah. marble dust. And they're like, oh, it's perfect. <laughs> right? And that is something that you kind of have to learn how to do in, in the film business as well. Uh, and I did a slightly different version of it in the mm -hmm. sense that the first version of the story that I pitched to SVT mm -hmm. was, was the version I knew that they were least likely to say yes to. Uh, because I felt like it was the craziest idea I could come up with. Yeah, sure. And it was all built on the fact that Olaf Palma faked his own death because he had AIDS, and then we find him, yeah, and we bring yeah. him back to Sweden, and he gives a speech to the whole country, and he, he feels very guilty, and, you know, but then he apologizes to the country, uh, and then as he starts talking about how much he, he, he's, how sad he is about how social democracy has gone into decline, and now that I'm back, I hope to help, and blah, 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 blah. and then the whole show was going to end with like a uh, sniper scope coming in like this Ooh. and shoom, cut to black. That was going to be the end of the show. <laughs> and the entire room went completely silent. Completely silent. Okay. Everyone looked at me like, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. I would love to see that one. I still think it might have been the best version of the show, to be honest with you. Um, so he faked his own death. He came faked, back. Yes. And got shot. And then we got and then we essentially got him killed. In the end. So I thought actually was... you pitched you pitched uh, like uh, live. In person, like, I wouldn't in the say room. worst scenario, but uh, a really um, a far out version, so you can. Yeah. Then this was after they meet their demands. And they had already said yes. We're going to give you a, de a, a, a development deal. Yeah. So the way these things work is that your first thing is that they give you a script development deal. Mm -hmm. uh, that breaks down in two phases. Mm -hmm. The first deal they give you is to write a long synopsis mm -hmm. for the whole series plus sure. the script for episode one. Okay. And once you jump through that hoop, then they give you the deal to write the rest of the scripts. But after they had already said yes to the development deal, mm -hmm. that was when I pitched them, them this. They were, they were like, okay, well, we've seen the trailer and we have an idea of what it is that you're trying to do here. And, um, you know, wh wh but what's the real story? Like, how, and then I pitched them that one, the one that I just said to you. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, is, do you have, is there a different way you could tell the story? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've got uh, like a bunch of different ideas. Yeah, sure. But the reason why I did that is because I wanted to hit him with the craziest idea that I had. Yeah. Because I had a bunch of other ideas that I thought were kind of fun and crazy, but I wanted them to seem less crazy, you know, when compared to, you know, yeah, exactly. the, the first one. So I, it was just a little... It's a mind game, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I can say that in some cases that worked out in my favor. Mm -hmm. In some cases, um, we were really... There were a lot of things that I, I wanted to put in the show that we still were yeah. were not allowed to. Okay. But but, I mean, now the premiere is in like April, is it? May third. May third. May third. May third on the CD. Sunday nights at nine. Yeah. So that's a pretty good slot. That, that's a really good slot. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah. are are you satisfied with the 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 final product, or do you feel that you oh I could have done more mm. with if they had only let me do this or that? 
I, I think it's pretty common that people, people in my position um, are very rarely satisfied. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a creative uh, yeah. process. Yeah. I mean, I, I can say that I'm happy, mm-hmm. um, but it's a, it's a brutal process, you know, um, because you... <laughs> You know, especially when it's an original idea. It's not, you know, a lot of people will write a script based on a book. You know, it's like, well, there you have kind of a roadmap yeah, sure, already sure. in place. You know what to do. Um, but this story for me was very, um, <clears throat> well, it was also quite personal, too, because there's a lot of my personal life sort of woven into the storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, my my father passed away, like, <sighs> two weeks before I signed the deal with Jaroski to, to write the show. Um, so I was going through all of that while I was working on this thing, and I managed to include some of that in the show. Um, and the hard part is is that, you know, for me, that's a really important part of the show. But there are moments, once you get into the editing room and you start realizing, you know, you, you need to make some difficult decisions when you start editing this thing that you've you've made. And in some cases things that are really important to me like I you I personally have to sort of set my own personal issues aside and look at it for what it is as a project and realize that in some cases when someone's suggesting like I think we should actually cut this part where you're talking about your father and and you know that they're right and you kind of have to agree with them despite the fact that you don't want to the feelings are Yeah, I'm telling you, it's it's an important part, of course. Yeah, because you know, for me, I thought that one of the important parts of the story was that I wanted this main character to start the story like in this emotional hole, mm-hmm. like, and he he's more or less using this this crazy idea of solving the Palmer case in one way is like is like this kind of weird idea that he comes up with that helps him to feel normal again. Mm-hmm. Like, this is how I'm going to manage to crawl out of this hole that I'm in by doing this crazy thing that everybody says can't be done. Uh, and I've been there. I've done those sort of things more than once in my life where you're kind of in that hole and and you come up with some ridiculous idea that you think is going to kind of help you get out of it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, But yeah, but for me, I've uh, dark comedy is the only genre that I, I'm, I feel like I'm really good at, mm-hmm. um, and part of it is because I have kind of a dark past. Yeah, sure. I have lost a, a lot of people besides my father, yeah. uh, <clears throat> and p- when you go through tragedies like that, you, it's the moment that you figure out a way to sort of laugh about it. Is is the moment that you realize that you're starting to kind of get over it. Yeah, you know a, what I mean. Like a healing process. Exactly. Yeah. And and it's also the moment that you realize that it, it never goes away. But but at the moment that you are able to sort of laugh about certain things is the moment that it starts to become more manageable. Yeah, sure. It doesn't right? hurt that much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so for me, like that's, I mean, that's what draw has always drawn me to not just to from a creative perspective but mm-hmm. also like the kind of movies that I like to watch or the kind of shows that I like to watch like I, I need them to be even if they're funny they need to be about something real yeah. you know something that really matters mm-hmm. and from a Swedish perspective I couldn't think of anything that mattered more than who killed Olaf Palma sure. you are you're originally from the US with a uh, different perspective if a Swede would have pitched this idea I I know that you say mm-hmm. the Swedes don't do uh, mm-hmm. uh, what you say blending um, the blending of the genres no, yeah. but w- would it ma- make a difference I mean it's a good you question. see it from, from, <clears throat> from the outside uh, somewhat at least I mean it's a good question I, th- I, I mean I think the real sort of key to the the ultimate success of the show being developed hmm. uh, the fact that it was being told from an outsider's perspective was part of the reason why why SVT decided to say yes I think um, that being said gosh I don't know I mean I remember at one point uh, I had an I, I you know I play the main character in the show uh, back when I couldn't get anybody to agree to make it I remember at one point I thought about like taking myself out of this like okay so I'm not in the show anymore I, maybe I should just try to find some Swedish actor okay. like somebody who um, I don't know somebody who everybody knows because nobody knows me 
right? No. I mean, at this point, no, nobody knows me. I understand. Uh, yeah. I've done a few things here and there, and and when this thing comes out, people, you know, you know, maybe a few people will go, "Oh, I saw him," and mm. I was in a show called The Inner Circle on Via Play, and mm. I did one mm. episode of Hilt Perfect last year, mm. and you know what? Like five people may have seen that. <laughs> I don't know, or or a lot of people watch Hilt Perfect, but I'm sure that. I doubt there'll be a lot of people that will go. But, uh, oh, that's I, that guy. Yeah, but I, I mean, haven't we seen like uh, Rolf Laskord and stuff like that being the uh, middle-aged man who tried to mm. find a new direction in life, uh, trying to? I mean, in this case, if he, mm. if if you would use a Swedish mm. actor, maybe trying to um, in a life crisis, trying to solve the Palmer case and stuff. I, I, I mean, I, I see one of the great things about this is mm. that it isn't mm. based on a Swedish uh, cast or right. a Swedish script. But you need to, I, I mean, we as yeah. Swedes need to look at it from outside and see how other people or other countries... It's other... kind of a, yeah, it's a weird situation because you, yeah. um, I put, look, uh, it's a weird thing because you hear a lot of people, like regular people kind of in my business who which is really not representative of the country. So I have no idea what the actual pulse of the Swedish people is mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. But most people in my business are, you know, complaining about the fact that there's too many, like, cop dramas, right? How yeah, many sure. frickin' franchised Swedish cop dramas do you have? Beck, Wallander, yeah, sure. You know? And they're all basically the same, right? It's the yeah. grumpy old white guy uh, who everybody is annoyed with, mm -hmm. but... He's also, he'd be out on the street fired and living like a homeless person if it wasn't for the fact that he's just so doggone good at his job. You know what I mean? And it's like, ugh, I'm yeah. so tired of that. You sure? um, but th the thing that you don't realize until you get kind of deeper into the TV business is that they don't keep making those shows because nobody's watching them, right? Yeah. Yeah. People watch them. Yeah, they, and not only do people watch them, they sell really well internationally. Mm, um, mm. If they didn't sell, if you weren't able to make money off of these grumpy old men solving murder cases, these shows wouldn't, they wouldn't be so prevalent. Mm. You wouldn't see them everywhere. Um, that being said, for me, from my perspective, I felt like w so many people are already doing that. Mm, mm. So I don't want to do that. Like, I'd rather have a character who is almost sort of the opposite of that. He has no skills. He has no background in investigating. Um, he's not a cop. He has no access to official information. <laughs> like, he has none of the things that make a show like Beck or Volander no. kind of easy when it comes to solving mm -hmm. the... I mean, of course, they manufacture these obstacles for them to solve the case. But at yeah. the same time, it's like, well, you know... How am I going to run a background check on someone? I can't, no. right? No. Or to run that license plate. You know, it's so easy in a cop show. Yeah, it is. You know what I mean? It and it just, it annoys me. And I was like, I want to do something that's like the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. um, keep me, It's very funny because it, it, it actually winds up helping uh, me, I think. Because ever since, I've been to a lot of places to talk about this show. Yeah. Um, we competed in this competition in France called Series Mania. It was like a pitch competition. This is yeah. before we actually wrote the whole show. Yeah. So at that point, I had a synopsis for the show, and I had this original trailer that I made to try and sell the show. And uh, we went up against like 15 other projects, and, and I would say 10 out of the 15 projects were all like thrillers. Okay. Same kind of Scand they were all If they weren't already Scandinavian noir, they were trying to be... Scandinavian noir. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. So they came from all kinds of, they, they came from all the, these projects came from all over Europe. Yeah, what, what is it created in the same form? Exactly. Yeah. They're all made in the same sausage yeah. factory, yeah. basically. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and then I got up to pitch, I was the last project mm. of 16 projects yeah. to be pitched. And to pitch this idea after all those, you know, once you hear, if you hear 10 thrillers yeah. in a row, mm. they've stopped being thrilling after about number two or three, you know, because they all function on the same kind of machinery. Yeah, not the roadmap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sure. 
so then when I got up there and pitched this thing, people were just like, what the hell is this? <laughs> uh, and then later that night, they announced who wins the competition, and lo and behold, it's, it's, it's us. We won this, this pitch competition. Wow. Um, and the, the jury was like, when I had dinner with them afterwards, they were mm-hmm. like, I was like, I was afraid we weren't going to win because our project is so weird. And he was like, no, you won because you're weird. Mm. Uh, it's something like, that's yeah. a, a little bit different, a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You, you're talking about uh, France, for example. Yeah. Do, do you have much of like uh, international uh, interest for the show? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the, um, the company that... Um, the company, well, I don't know if they own whatever. Jaroski is part of a larger group. There's a company called Banerjee. I don't think they necessarily own Jaroski, but Jaroski is just sort of part of their team, so to speak, right? So they have what's called um, a first look, first look deal, basically. Mm-hmm. So if Jaroski wants to do a project, if Banerjee likes it, they can say, "Yeah, we want to help you do it." And they are sort of the international part of that operation. So, mm-hmm. so the show, um, the way it breaks down is that the, the SVT owns the rights to. Um, Sweden, yeah, to yeah. broadcast in Sweden. Sure. I'm pretty sure that Viaplay is going to own the rights for the rest of Scandinavia, mm-hmm. like Finland, Norway, uh, Denmark, Denmark, Iceland, yeah. all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Banerjee will be responsible for selling the show to the rest of the world. Okay. Okay. So that's sort of the simple breakdown yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we've already started working on that. I was in London two weeks ago pitching to a group of... Uh, Distributors, and we're going back to France. Yeah. We've been invited back to Series Mania at the end of March to do a presentation about the show, sort of a victory lap after having yeah, sure. won the award two years ago and then coming back mm-hmm. after having made the show. Apparently, we're the fastest yeah. to have ever gone from actually winning that award to making a TV show. Innan vi avslutar intervjun frågade jag Skefino om det var något som han kände att vi inte pratat om. Och visst var det det. För när det här spelades in dagen efter palmevandringen 2020 hade palmeåklagaren Christer Petersson nyligen gått ut och sagt att han skulle presentera en lösning på mordet inom ett halvår. Så här säger Skefino om det. Well, I mean, the only thing I guess we haven't talked about is like the fact that they're closing the case for real. Yeah. Like... I mean, that to me is like what insane timing to have made a television show yeah. about some jackass <laughs> who wants to solve the murder of Olaf Palma. Yeah. And I mean, we're like, what, two months away from this show coming out? Mm-hmm. And, and the real head of the Palma group comes out and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to close the case in like four or five months. <laughs> I, I mean, like... I mean it's, a, it's, it's, a good, it's a good synopsis for a comedy. I... That's that one as well. <clears throat> well, not only that, I remember the day they announced that Christian yeah. Pedersen was going to be the new head of the Palmer Group. I was like, this has to be a joke. Mm-hmm. The um, name? Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, fine, he spells it differently, but still. Come it's on. one T. It's only one letter T that is different. I was like, this, again, oh, comedy this is going to be good. Yeah, sure. All over again. <laughs> but the fact that the, I mean, I really think that this is kind of fascinating. I feel, A, quite fortunate that that my show is going to be co- the release of the show will coincide with the announcement yeah, yeah. in some way um, but I'm just so fascinated to see what the reaction is going to be mm. um, I mean we talked about this last night yeah, so, sure. uh, I think you and I are in large part um, in agreement that I mm-hmm. think that the, the easiest way for them to kind of wrap this thing up is to obviously to to pin it on someone who's no longer alive because then it just makes it that much easier Absolutely. to close the case um, but I just I'm so I, I almost don't even want to predict what the actual reaction is going to be yeah. you know what I mean because I feel like I mean most Swedes have by and large kind of moved on from this right sure. Sure. and maybe they're going to react to it like Eh. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Yeah, we don't. We didn't. We stopped caring about that years ago, anyway. Mm-hmm. But I think that the people who still care about the case, it's going to be. 
a very noisy minority mm -hmm. yeah, of people who are going to yeah. be really upset yeah. uh, about how this is being handled, I think. Because as, as we said last night when we did the, the Palme Wandering, mm -hmm. the Palme Walk, um, they can present a solution, solution mm -hmm. within quotes, mm -hmm. uh, and it might be correct, we don't know, mm -hmm. but you'll never get all Swedes or even all interested in the Palma case mm -hmm. to accept that solution. Every, not everyone maybe, but many people will have their own solution sure. because they have for 30 some years been thinking that the police did it, the, the KGB did it, or CIA, whatever. Yeah, take your pick. Yeah, take Doesn't your matter. Pick. Whoever they say. It was like I said last night, for every one person that believes, let's say, I personally think they're going to try to pin it on the Scandiaman. Yes, for every one person who believes that the Scandiaman is responsible for the murder of Olaf Palma, yeah, yeah. there are thousands of people who think that that theory is ridiculous. Yeah. And I, I mean, I talked to people who said, Scandiaman is not on my top five list. You have like uh, uh, Christo A, uh, the guy who shot himself mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. sold his weapon outside the Capri Opera. That one's way more convincing than... Yeah, even I, that one. I mean... I, it's so much more convincing. I remember when I read that theory and I thought, yeah. This is very. Uh, this seems quite plausible to me, but it would make the most boring TV show of all time because it's like, yeah. wh wh where do you go with that? But but yeah, but you but you have the comedy. He went to yeah. Cafe Opera. You're yeah. sitting there sipping on the tea, yeah. Yeah. and he has like a, a 357 Magnum mm -hmm. and sells to a random uh, drug dealer. I mean, <laughs> it's. You must admit it, it's somewhat yeah. humorous. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, but, but I think it's um, not for whole TV series. No, but it's more like a. I see the Christopher A story as more of a. That could be a feature film. Yeah, maybe not no, a maybe, TV series. No, maybe so, maybe so. Uh, but I really do. I'm so. I almost like I said. I don't even want to predict what's going to happen. No, but I'm just no. so. Uh, I'm really interested to see where where it, where it goes, how it leads, mm. um, because of course we're obviously. I mean, this I, we're interested in doing a second season of this show and I mean, I've already started working on the story for season two but you yeah. kind of you sort of have to kind of I mean it, it, you, I, I can put together a basic structure for it sure. but at the same time you kind of have to wait until this whole thing goes down yeah. because it's really going to change how I think the story should be told I think and so I'm basically kind of playing around with different scenarios yeah. um on on how to how to deal with that in a fictional setting. Is there anything you can say about now? Of course, we haven't seen the first uh, series yet. We don't know right. the end there. And uh, yeah. but it, uh, I mean, say if they pin uh, Scandiaman for it, would you like do a scenario when you describe him as a murder? This somewhat comical figure sitting sipping on uh, whiskey on his office. Yeah. And. Uh, Oh, it's uh, 23, 18, 19, I think. I, I have to go. I mean, I forgot it. I'm the... supposed to go shoot Olaf Palma. <laughs> Damn, I'm almost late. <laughs> I'll drink my oh. I'll drink my tea when I come back. Yeah. <laughs> I would watch that. We don't even we don't else. even mention the Scandiaman no, in no. season one no. because I just didn't think that was a very interesting. I mean, he's an interesting character. Yeah, for sure. But. You know, you realize when you when you write something like this, if you once you start talking about something related to the case, you kind of the characters in the show mm. need to you need to follow up on it. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it, it, it's just an interesting tidbit, mm. right? Mm. And that's where you start to kind of lose the structure mm. if you spend too yeah. much time talking about things you're not actually going to follow up on. Sure. And with Scandiaman, I was like, well, I don't know where to go with that. Mm. You know. But, I don't know. I think people are going to love it. I think it's going to be crazy. Mm. I think it's going to be like something that most people have never seen before. No. And be sure to watch it uh, yeah. May the 3rd May the at 3rd. Uh, 9 in yeah, the evening. Sundays at 9. Sundays at 9. I don't know how really they're going to... Yeah, I don't know if they're going to release them one a week or if they're going to release them all at once. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, probably one a week. I would say one a week. Probably. Sometimes, they, I, as you know, they put yeah. on the streaming service uh, all the episodes. But I think mm -hmm. one a week must be the best one. Skip Mussara, thank you so much for coming here and for talking with us. And the best of luck with uh, the TV series. Really appreciate it. And we will, we will watch it. 
I promise. Right on. Thanks for having me. Därmed säger vi tack till Skiafin och Mosara som vi alltså kommer att få se mer av i Sveriges Television från den 3 maj 2020. Fotorna från intervjun som ni bland annat kan se på Youtube-videon till det här avsnittet är tagna av Josefin Molén. Det här var veckans avsnitt av podden Palmemodet som gjordes av mig, Tobias Henriksson på PRS Media. För mer information om mig och mina projekt besök facebook.com-prsmedia.se eller gilla oss på Instagram där vi heter PRS Media, ett ord, små bokstäver. För att sponsra kommande avsnitt gå in på patreon.com-palmemodet och skänk en summa som podden får per publicerat avsnitt. Till sist... Stort tack till alla som kommer med feedback på facebook.com-palmemodet. Men framförallt, stort tack för att du lyssnar på på den palmemodet. Man hittar Palmes mördare om man följer PKK-spåret till botten. För att ändå sedan Julius Cesus tid har aldrig kunnat tala som ett mot på en framstående politiker som inte har politiska skäl. Polisens och åklagarens teori var att han ensam hade skjutit Olof Palm. Och det ledde också till rättegång. Men han frikändes i hovrätten. Nu ska vi ut och röva, tror jag. Vi ska ut och röva.